Today we're looking at a lesson titled Move On to Maturity. Wow. <laughs> Move On to Maturity. Turn to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, the sixth chapter, we want verses one to two. <clears throat> writer of the book of Hebrews is admonishing those that he's writing to because of their recalcitrance in growing and maturing. And uh, <clears throat> he's saying to them, it's time, past time, for you to grow You've been in the Lord long enough to be teachers. Now you basically need to be taught again the principles, the basics of the, the doctrines of Christ. And he goes on, <clears throat> chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection or maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of the laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. So what he's saying here is it's time for us to get past the preliminaries, to get past the basics, and go on to the significant things of the teachings of Christ. Well, of course, in the past, since the time of the Reformation, 600 years approximately, the church is still on basics. Still concerned about baptisms, they're still concerned about the basic formats of uh, whether you <clears throat> baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, or Jesus only. Uh, things that are majoring on the minors. <clears throat> we want to take a look at what the scripture says the Christian should be focusing on to bring him to a state of maturity. Scripture teaches the saint is to pursue deeper revelation that will mature and prepare him for the Christ life. Turn to Hebrews, the fifth chapter, right above there, verses 13 to 14. But when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need of one to teach you again, which is of the first principles of the oracles of God. And are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For every one that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. For strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern good and evil. You become mature when you can detect, detect, in the scripture, <clears throat> good and evil. When you can detect <clears throat> deception from truth in the word of God. And that comes at the point in which the saint becomes conversant with the basic fundamental principles of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When you're grounded in the basics of <clears throat> Salvation, repentance, and what the scripture says about the eternality of Jesus Christ. You become grounded in the fundamentals, the basic groundwork of the teachings of Christ. And then you go on from there into the deeper aspects. Now we want to take a look at three principles that will lead a saint to maturity. Scripture teaches three assets which the Spirit will impart to the one who will pursue them. These three assets lead to spiritual maturity. <clears throat> what are the three assets? They are knowledge of one's calling, knowledge of one's inheritance in Christ, and knowledge of the power that will strengthen the saint through the trials of life. I'm going to repeat that. 
They are knowledge of one's calling, what you have been called to do, knowledge of one's inheritance, what God has for you in this life and in eternity, and knowledge of the power that will strengthen through the trials of life. Being able to call upon the strength that comes through Christ to enable you to overcome the obstacles so that you can grow. These three, these three are the basic principles a saint should be pursuing once he learns the fundamentals, the basics of Christian doctrine. Once he learns the essentials of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, he should begin to pursue these three attributes. Turn to the book of Ephesians, first chapter. Verses 17 to 19. Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 17 to 19. Paul illustrates this. As you're turning, Paul is commending the Ephesians for being Christians. They have shown, basically, what the portrayal of a, crew, of a true Christian is. That is, love for one another. That's the basic litmus test of whether a person is really saved or not. Genuine love for the brethren. And then Paul, after he commends them for that, goes on to tell them what they should begin to do. Verse 17, it says he's praying for them that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, God the Father, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So the saint is to pursue understanding that comes from the spirit, which the Father will give to that one that's open to receive it. Now what will happen when the spirit comes imparting this knowledge. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. In other words, you will gain comprehension of the three attributes. That you may know what is the hope of his calling. That's the first thing a saint should pursue. What it is he's called to do. And what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. What it is that you have in Christ. The disciples weren't afraid or ashamed to ask Jesus. Peter stood right up and said, we followed you, we've left everything, what's in it for us? And Jesus was delighted to explain what the inheritance would be. Verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, word, who believe according to the working of his mighty power? You cannot... You cannot achieve the first two unless you're operating in the last. If you don't have the power of God operating in you, you're going to be sidetracked, you're going to be defeated, you're going to be brought low and limited before you even engage in pursuing the other two attributes. Because you live in a world that's fallen, you live in a world that's dominated by Luciferian influence, mind, body, and soul are constantly under Luciferian influence, and unless you are operating in the power of God, you do not have the resolve to continue on pursuing the things of God. Take a look around you. How many Christians are sold out for Christ that you know of? How many talk about the Lord every chance they get? How many are delighted to pray? How many are delighted to do, seek the Word of God, the knowledge of God, the principles of God? No. Most Christians are focused on the things of this world, the problems, the vicissitudes of life, just trying to keep your head above water. That's not what God intended for his people. Why is that? Because they're not operating in the power of God, in the strength that would enable them to overcome that stuff. Let's go on. Pursuing these three attributes 
will lead us on the path of maturity. Scripture teaches Paul proclaimed his knowledge of these three attributes consistently so he could set an example for the churches to follow. Turn to Romans, the first chapter, verse 1. He says the three attributes are becoming aware of your calling. Romans, the first chapter, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Paul wants the church to know who he is, what his calling is. He says, I am an apostle. I've been called to be an apostle, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to manifest the office of apostle, which I've been authorized to do. Now turn to the book of Galatians, the first chapter. Galatians, the first chapter, verse 1. Paul well, not only identifies what he is, but he goes on to say, basically, that he's not going to be deterred from what he's calling it. Galatians, the first chapter, verse 1, we read, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ. And God, the Father, who raised him from the dead. Now, Paul is saying, basically, I've been called to be an apostle, not by men or circumstances, but by God. Now, Paul had a rough time. Paul was not immediately received as a genuine apostle by the other apostles. That's why he writes this. The gospel that he was given was not immediately received by the other apostles. They looked down their nose at Paul as though he were a usurper, as though he were not a genuine apostle because their litmus test of an apostle would be somebody that walked and talked with Christ. Paul said basically in his writings, I don't care what you say, I am an apostle by Jesus Christ who called me and gave me the gospel. Matter of fact, Go on to um, uh, verse 11 and 12. Paul says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the apostles that were given the mandate, the new, the great commission to go and preach and teach the gospel, Paul says, it, it, it would, didn't have anything to do with me, because I'm an apostle equal to them. The, the gospel that I received didn't come from them. It came directly from Jesus Christ. And that was another reason why they wouldn't receive him immediately as an apostle. Because the gospel that he was teaching, the gospel he was preaching, basically was centered on the Gentiles, not the Jews. And they basically had a rough time, hard time accepting Paul's gospel until he showed them the fruit of what his calling was. They had a big meeting in Jerusalem. And Paul brought members of the churches that he had founded and that were actively engaged in doing the work of Christ, the ministry of Christ, to Jerusalem, refused to have them circumcised, and presented them. And as he presented them, the Holy Spirit fell. And they could see signs and wonders and these men speaking things of God. And he says, after they saw this, they gave me the right hand to fellowship. They accepted me then as a regular, a true apostle. Paul said he, wouldn't, he wasn't concerned with the approval of men. He knew what his calling was. He stepped into his calling and he wasn't about to let circumstances and the pressures of the world and even his brethren deter him from that. We should have the same 
mindset. When you find what it is that God has called you to do, that should be the central focus of your whole life. I don't care if it's the closest of your family, circumstances, job, whatever it is, it should not deter you from what God has called you to do. Because every one of us that are in Christ, one day we're going to have to stand before God and give an account of what we did with the time we were given here. Did we do what we were called to do? Or did we cave and compromise? So Paul illustrates the fact that he is pursuing his calling. He uses this, as he says, to demonstrate to the churches setting, setting an example for them to follow. Turn to Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 16 and 18. Paul consistently spoke about the heritage inheritance. Romans 8, 16 to 18. Three attributes. Pursuing your calling, learning your heritage, what it is that you have in Christ, and drawing on the strength that will enable you to complete what it is that you have been called to do. Now, Romans the 8th chapter, 16 to 18. It says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So you will never have to doubt your salvation if you're in Christ. The Holy Spirit, if you're in tune with the Holy Spirit, if you're open to the Holy Spirit, He will quicken you no matter what situation is taking place. You may flop egregiously and do something that uh, you're ashamed of, come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But He will confirm to you that you are still a child of God. Amen. Never doubt your position in Christ by the things you do. Because the things you do didn't make you saved. It's your belief in Christ that saves you. And it's your belief in Christ that sustains you. Paul says, Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. You can spend a lifetime pursuing the knowledge of your inheritance. Most people are oblivious as to what it is that they have in Christ. Because they're not taught, not encouraged to pursue the importance of your inheritance. Paul uh, specifically demonstrates this. Turn to, again to the book of Galatians, the fourth chapter. Galatians, the fourth chapter, we want verses four to seven. Four chapter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 it says, When the fullness of the time was come, in other words, when the span of God's program reached a certain point, the God sent Jesus Christ into the world to fulfill his master plan. Galatians 4, starting in verse 4, and then read down to verse 7. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. So he became human. Why? To redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So it's our relationship 
in Jesus Christ that makes us the Son of God. And if we are sons of God, Paul repeats this in Galatians, he repeats it in Romans. If we are sons of God, we become heirs of God. Now, sonship has nothing to do with gender. I cannot repeat that enough. Sonship has nothing to do with gender. Turn to Galatians, third chapter, verses 27 to 28. In Christ, you lose your gender identity. Galatians, third chapter, verse 27 to 28. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You put on the identity of Christ. When you do that, you lose your identity. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. You lose your earthly identity, your earthly attributes, everything pertaining to the Adamic Identity that you had, as far as God is concerned, no longer exists. Old things are passed away. All things become new. That yes. includes the law. Everything. Everything. You literally become a new creation. A being that didn't exist before. You have new attributes. You have a totally new identity. Why is it that people are trying to drag the old into the new with them? God says that's to be cut off and, 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 and uh, basically walk away from it. Embrace your new identity. Pursue your new identity. The heritage, the inheritance comes with a new identity as a son of God. Holy Spirit will give you comprehension of what you have inherited. You say, well, what is it that I've inherited? Turn to Revelation 21st chapter, verse 7. Revelation 21, verse 7. All things, right? <laughs> Revelation 21, verse 7. This is the Father himself speaking. You don't know how rich that is. I got it. <laughs> that is so deep, so rich. All things. Ooh, deep. 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 Things you can't purchase, things you can't buy. This is the Father himself speaking. He says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So you have God himself that created all things. Hmm that go beyond the ability of the human mind to comprehend. We can only comprehend a small percentage of the things of God. But everything you can comprehend, you've inherited. If you believe it, the things that we have in this life are temporal. In other words, they pass away because everything in this reality is temporary. Nothing here was ever created to be permanent. It's created for a time, and after that time is over, it passes away. But well, God has made it convenient for His children to enjoy all things, because in Him all things exist. And in Him you participate in this life, in the inheritance. Turn to the book of James, first chapter, verse 17. As you pursue, as you pursue your calling, then you line up with the requirements to receive all things from God. James, the first chapter, right after Hebrews. And when you get there, verse 17. Oh. 
every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. <clears throat> so what happens here, when you begin to pursue these attributes that we're speaking about, your calling, your inheritance, the power to manifest, overcome the right. obstacles, the blessings begin to automatically come into your life. Don't listen to this stuff that you're hearing, this watered-down pablum that is being spoken about pursuing blessings, pursuing the goodies as a Christian. No, you don't pursue blessings. You pursue your calling. You pursue what God has called you to do. And then the blessings automatically come mm. into your life. Turn to Matthew, the sixth chapter. Verse 33 to 34. Matthew, sixth chapter, verse 33 to 34. Now, when you really start pursuing the Lord, things of the world just don't seem that appealing anymore. They are. You are blessed with the things you need and with the things you desire, too. Right. But it's, it you just don't have that that's like they did before. No, no. Okay. It's, it's, just, that, well, it's, it's an not illusion. What you, it's not what you really want. It's an illusion yeah. to begin with. It's just something that comes naturally. What you really want to pursue is that, that relationship. Exactly. That's the reward. That only comes to the Holy Spirit. You need a spanking. Probably a parole officer. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew 6 chapter <laughs> 33 to 34 but seek ye first the kingdom of God repeat that seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you what are the things he's talking about you look up in the Previous passages of Scripture. <clears throat> he says, uh, verse 28, Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like unto one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall ye not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, in other words, don't stress, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, wherewithal shall you be clothed. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Unsaved people are consistently worried about having their needs met. And so they pursue careers, they pursue wealth, they pursue positions to guarantee that their needs will be met in the style in which they feel it should be met. I've heard a person say, I can't live without unless I'm earning $100,000 a year. No. <laughs> they call uh, the thing the cost of living. What does it cost you to live? In Orange County, poverty level is $85,000 a year. Everybody's life is gauged in terms of how much money they make. It's an illusion. The scripture is telling us that stuff has no part in the life of a saint. God knows what we need. God knows how much we need, when we need it. And God is well able to provide that need. Jesus said that shouldn't be the focus of a saint. That's the focus of unsaved people. Then he goes on. For after all these things that the Gentiles seek for your heavenly Father, knoweth that ye have need of all these things, but seek ye first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. What is seeking the kingdom of God? Seeking your calling. What is it that God has called you to do in this life? Everyone in Christ has a purpose. The problem is that 99.9% .9 of the people in Christ don't know their purpose. You speak to people who say, I've sat on a church pew for 30 years. I still don't know what God called me to do. That's a shame. That's a shame. That should not be. God is not reluctant to let us know what he wants us to do. It's our opposition 
to hearing the voice of God that prevents us from knowing what our calling is and pursuing our calling. Pursue your calling and all these things will come to you. That's a promise from God. Paul illustrates this consistently. He says that we have the Holy Spirit in us, direct us and guide us into all truth. <clears throat> Let's go on. Paul consistently proclaimed these three attributes in his life so that he could demonstrate them so that the church could see how they need to proceed to have them come into their life. Turn to Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse 13. We said the last attribute dealt with learning about the power that's already within us that will enable us to withstand the opposition to pursuing what God's called us to pursue. Philippians, fourth chapter, verse 13. So when he says that he will provide what you need, basically it's whatever you need for a particular circumstance. Um, That's part of it. It's whatever you need to perform what he's called you to do. Whatever you need to enable you to remain free. Whatever you need for that particular situation that will provide it. That's not whatever you want. Right. Are yes. there people in the church that are they they say they believe in God but they got all these mental emotions too? Yeah. Well like they carry all this excessive baggage? Yeah. Yeah. Because they're not following the three attributes. Oh, okay. We find Philippians here. <clears throat> You act so surprised. Not so bad. Philippians, the third chapter, we're going to start verse 11 to 13. Not that I speak in respect of want or need, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I'm sorry, Philippians, which chapter? Fourth chapter. Or Four, 11, or, okay. 11 to 13. Oh, I'm sorry. Paul <laughs> illustrates a principle here. Learn to be content in your state of life. If you are where God wants you, learn to be content in that situation. Now, Paul is writing this from a jail cell. Solitary <laughs> confinement. So he's illustrating in the, the most... Uh, degree that you could possibly illustrate this principle. I've learned to be content wherever I am because I know this is where God wants me to be. Mm. Can you just elaborate a touch more that Paul went looking for situations? Oh, well, that's dealt with the, when, you, when you learn about the strength that comes from God. But basically what, what is being said, when you learn to be content where you are, mm -hmm. then you'll look around and you will see need. You will see that God is using you where you are to bless other people, to bring forth, to manifest his reality to others. Paul did this from a jail cell. The epistles were written from a jail cell, and they blessed millions of people. 2,000 years later, they're blessing millions of people. He said learn to be content. And you'll see people's needs when you quit focusing on your own needs exactly. and seek the kingdom of heaven, which is his will for your life. Exactly. That's where the contentment comes from. You can see other You're people's not... needs. And I'm sorry, Richard. That's okay. That's all right. It's such a you blessing. It's, <laughs> no, it's such a blessing being able to meet other people's needs, being used by God to, be, to deliver those needs oh, to other okay. people. That is such an awesome exactly. spiritual feeling. Exactly, but most Christians don't get to see that. Because they don't get to that level. Uh, and it's as a result of the world that we live in. The Luciferian influence that dominates this world is never, never, never going to cut you any slack. You have to fight for everything you get from God. Because you have a thief right there 
at your footsteps trying to rob you from it. Whether it's peace, love, joy, blessing, calling, whatever it is. He's out to rob you from it, to steal, kill, and destroy, the scripture said. So, what you find here, the scripture is telling us <coughs> the mindset that comes from the assurance of applying these three principles will rest ruling upon you <coughs> consistently. Paul says, I've learned to be content whether I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. In other words, there's going to be times when you're not on the mountaintop. There's going to be times you're going through a valley. There's going to be times when things are not so pleasant. But God will give you the ability to endure all things to the strength that comes from him. This is what Paul is trying to illustrate in his writings. <clears throat> I can do all things. All things. It's an unqualified statement. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. It's within him. And there are other scriptures that Paul talks about. He didn't learn this overnight. It came through experience. There's uh, scriptures you read, 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, where he's going through great depression. Great depression until he realizes, the Holy Spirit quickens him, that he's doing all this in his own strength. And he needs to relax and let the strength that comes from God manifest in him and it will take him through whatever it is he's dealing with. The same thing is true with us. We are basically programmed by the world, by the fall, to operate in our intellect and in our own puny ability. When you have God's <laughs> presence in us, with us, but he's not going to force anything on us until we yield and say, Lord, not my will, but thy will. Let your strength come through me. And immediately, you'll feel it. Immediately, it will well up within you. Immediately, you'll feel the desire to praise him. you feel the desire to walk in a way in which you haven't walked before. There's a strength and an assurance and a confidence that will come to you because you have the spirit in you that's embracing you and strengthening you through whatever trial you may experience. And then <clears throat> what will happen is your circumstances will change. God is only waiting a lot of times for us to submit to his will so that he can begin to affect changes in the things we're dealing with. When that happens, you'll see your circumstance from a different perspective. It won't be a mountain that's insurmountable anymore. It'll be a little molehill that you'll just walk over. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. So, <coughs> it seems like yeah. <coughs> um, 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 serious intent. Uh, it's, it seems sort of sterile. Where is God when it comes to happiness and this, you know, joy? It says that, but when, when we read for how we're to go about obtaining um, the Spirit and what the Spirit will guide us in, it's, it seems like, um, yeah, we're being trained for heavenly life while still here. God gave each individual their own mind and living here under the influence, there are still things here that are beautiful and uh, things that people would, would enjoy being or doing. Mm -hmm. And if we are to seek God completely, seek the Spirit completely, they're going to train us in heavenly things. Um, then, like Paul, Paul ignored everything. He's, he's, 
all his focus was was on God and Jesus. So that eliminated all the things that um, would be considered fun. Uh, his was a serious mission, but that was him. But if we are to follow that, then uh, we give up that desire to engage in anything other than the obligation and the duty of becoming more like Christ. What we do, if we yield to the Holy Spirit, truly yield to the Holy Spirit, we will enjoy life in a way in which we've never enjoyed it before, here and now. Jesus enjoyed life. Matter of fact, he enjoyed sitting down to a table with a good meal. That's why they called him a glutton, <laughs> wine bibber. <clears throat> we enjoy it. God didn't create this life for the devil. He created it for his people. The problem that we have is that we have a perception which is distorted and contorted through a mindset, which the scripture tells us is carnal, in which we can enjoy life the way God designed it to be enjoyed. The Holy Spirit will give us an enjoyment of this life here and now that will enable us to experience a joy and a peace and a happiness we didn't experience before. It's not just, this is not a separation where this is heaven, that's earth. No, everything is interrelated in Christ. He said, I come to them and have life and have it more abundantly here and now. As you yield to the Spirit, He will show you things about life here and now you never saw before. He will give you a peace and a happiness. The problem that many of us have is we limit ourselves through our intellectual comprehension of things. Just let it go. Let it go. Begin to praise God with your heart, with your soul, with your mind. Immediately that frees you up, body, soul, and spirit, to receive God in the way in which he presents himself. We have 5,000 years of programming that we have to shock in order to get to the point in which we accept and receive God the way he wants to be received. He will show us all things in a true state. The human mind doesn't see objectively, doesn't see things the way they are, he sees things the way they appear to be. In Christ, the Holy Spirit will show us things as they truly are, about ourselves, about the world we live in, about Christ, about eternity. He will give us a true perspective of all things. But we have to yield to him to allow him to do it. If we do, if we just lay aside our own carnal way of seeing things, our own human perspective, and just let God be God. It's simplicity. God operates in simplicity. All he says is, yield to me, child. Let me be who I am in you. And then it, it goes forth. You'll change circumstances in your life. You'll allow his blessings to come into your life. It's a win-win situation. But the, the scripture says, receive him as a little child. And watch what he does. Donnie, would you ask the Lord's blessing? On the thank you. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for um, thank you for your spirit to lead us and guide us through all truth. Oh, yes, God. God. Lord, I just have a desire to know more about you. You're an awesome God, Father God. And I just want to be more like you, Lord. I pray that you reveal yourself to us more and more each every day, Lord. And our goal becomes... You're finding out our will in life, Lord, Father God, and finding out your will for us, Father God. We just thank you and give you glory in all things, Father. Amen. 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 Thank you.